Mondays are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the monthly webinar of the Western Center for Metropolitan Extension and Research. My name is Martha Aitken and I'm a Senior Associate for Metropolitan Extension for Washington State University and I'm filling in as your host today for Center Director Brad Gerlach. The Western Center for Metropolitan Extension and Research was established by the Western Extension Directors Association with funding from the extension programs of the University of Alaska Fairbanks, University of California, Colorado State University, University of Idaho, Oregon State University, and Washington State University, who hosts the center. Before we get started, if you haven't used GoToWebinar before, I'd like to go over a few useful features. The webinar will work best on your computer if you close other applications while you participate. On the menu bar, the blue screen button lets you toggle between a full screen and a partial screen. If you want to view the webinar at full screen, you will want to toggle back to enter a question in the questions pod. The orange arrow opens and hides your control panel. You may enter your questions into the questions pod at any time. However, we will wait until the end of the program to ask questions of our presenter. Our webinar today is being recorded for later viewing, including all questions posted in the questions pod. Following the presentation, there will be a very brief electronic evaluation. I hope you'll take a moment to provide your feedback. The Western Extension Directors established the Center to increase the internal capacity of extension programs to address metropolitan issues and to elevate the stature and value of cooperative extension to external metropolitan audiences. The overarching goal of the Center is to help extension better align programs with the needs, issues, and interests of their metropolitan constituency. The Center's goals and priorities are accomplished through professional development and applied research activities. The Center believes that to be successful in the future, extension professionals will need to have project development and management skills, multicultural and multi multilingual capacities, the ability to work through intermediary organizations, the ability to relate cross-generationally, and the ability to evaluate program impacts within the context of multi-stakeholder collaborations. As such, the Center will provide professional development opportunities through workshops, staff exchanges, and webinars. The Center has a two-pronged research agenda to conduct research on effective metropolitan organizational and staffing models and best practices in programming, delivery, and evaluation and to explore emerging metropolitan issues where land-grant universities can contribute to decision-making and policy development. Through such objective research and recommendations, extension programs will be able to provide communities with a basis for informed decision-making. Before we begin today's presentations, we have a few questions for you. So helping me on the technical end of the broadcast today is Don Pearson Pullman on our main campus. And Don, can you please launch the polls? So our first question today is please select the program areas that you work in and you may select all that apply. And we will give you a moment to respond. And uh, Don, can you show us the responses, please? Looks like the majority of our folks are in agriculture and administration today, but a good distribution everywhere else. So the next question, please is what is your primary role within your organization? And just select one this time, please. And Don, if you can please show us the results. Okay. 
Thank you again, a fairly even distribution, a majority of county directors today. And finally, what is your position within your university? And just select one, please. And if you can show the results, please, Don. Primarily professional staff and faculty today. So thank you, Don, and thank you, everybody, for participating. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's presentation, Penn State Center, Engaging Pittsburgh with Dr. Dino DeShantis. Dr. DeShantis has been the director of the Penn State Center Pittsburgh since it was established seven years ago. Housed in a state-of-the-art building called the Energy Innovation Center, the center has raised Penn State's profile in the Pittsburgh region with expanded educational and research programming. The center serves as an urban platform for Penn State, connecting individuals, families, communities, and businesses to learning partnerships and applying research-based knowledge to create informed solutions for critical local issues. Previously, Dino was County Extension Director for Penn State Extension of Allegheny County for 15 years, and before that, as the 4-H Youth Development Coordinator. Prior to joining Penn State, Dino had a career with Head Start, ultimately serving as the Head Start Director, and he was Associate Director of the Division of Early Childhood for the Pittsburgh Public Schools. He has served on numerous committees and task forces for Penn State, local government, and the community, including past president of the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, Duquesne University Century Club of Distinguished Alumni, president of the Green Innovators Board, the Board of Autumn House Press, past president of the Three Rivers Community Foundation Board, and chair of Allegheny County's Green Action Team. Dino holds three education-related degrees from Duquesne University, culminating in an interdisciplinary doctorate in educational leadership. Dino, welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the invitation to share my thoughts and, uh, and the development of our Penn State Center in Pittsburgh here. Uh, I've been speaking uh, about this for quite some time, and my presentation today is going to cover a little bit of history, a little bit of framing uh, why Pittsburgh, and uh, talk about some of the initiatives at Penn State. So uh, let me just begin with uh, a little bit of framing. Most of you are probably familiar with uh, with some of this. We we make this argument regularly. Uh, those of us in in the uh, in the urban field, and uh, these are arguments and uh, discussions that we press uh, within the context of our state here. And uh, as we talk about the demographic uh, shift in terms of the changing population from when um, uh, the land grant started, and certainly when extension started some hundred years ago that the demographic flip has gone from 80% um, rural to 80% urban, and in some states, actually, even more than that. In, uh, in Pennsylvania, we have uh, about 25% of, uh, of our population uh, resides in Philadelphia and in Allegheny County, the, the county in which uh, Pittsburgh sits. And then about um, five or six other counties, if you add them to the mix, uh, we get to about half of the population of the state. I'm going to guess that that's pretty similar to, to many of the other states out there. Uh, another, another significant issue uh, with respect to where urban extension sits within the context of, of extension is the political balance uh, for all intents and purposes. Elected officials uh, are clustered around our urban areas, and so in order for us to make our case, we have to figure out how to balance the communication that we are presenting to our elected officials, making uh, that information equally available to those in urban areas, uh, many of whom don't really understand uh, what we do or had not in the past. 
there's also the the consideration of stakeholders and what the definition of stakeholders is. We have these discussions with regularity and and uh, it's a, it's an argument that that we push here in Pennsylvania all the time, and that is who are our stakeholders and what is the uh, what is their political power within the context of, uh, of our state legislature, particularly with respect to supporting our budgets. And uh, I think the definition of stakeholders is continuing to evolve. We uh, in Pennsylvania use the uh, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau as a, a major stakeholder in terms of uh, forwarding our message. And of course, there's a lot of discussion around that uh, with respect to what, how is there a way of diversifying uh, the stakeholders who represent us and uh, have other significant voices in there. One could argue that um, uh, that regardless, uh, the proof is in the pudding and declining uh, funding levels over many decades at this point now uh, in some ways proves that we really do need to diversify our stakeholders. <clears throat> Programming relevance is another issue. In, in that, uh, for the most part, a lot of our programming is geared towards the uh, production side and uh, our urban areas are primarily consumers, but also in issue areas there are um, uh, items and challenges that urban areas encounter that tend not to be covered by most of our standard extension programs. And so, again, another area in which we need to advocate strongly. And then uh, another is a remarkable opportunity for the university to have um, an increased level of, uh, of um, exposure in our urban areas. Most of our land grants across the country, as is the case here in Pennsylvania, the, most, uh, the main brick and mortar is uh, somewhere other than our highly populated uh, areas. So I go a little bit uh, about uh, our history and kind of how we uh, came to be here and, and I'll start the history from when I started um, at Penn State here in 1990. Um, there at the time and, and certainly for quite some time preceding that, there is this um, amount of tension between rural and urban and the conversations always seemed to be back then this notion that if you were um, if you were urban you were anti-rural if you were rural you were anti-urban I think that those discussions certainly have changed significantly over the years and we see that we're on both uh, kind of this different sides of the same coin and how we move that conversation uh, is is important from 93 to about 05 uh, we really started the early efforts at establishing some level of standing for urban programming. Uh, in, in, at Penn State, what ended up happening was uh, one of the uh, former deans felt that there was a gap in, in the process of doing uh, strategic planning for the college and, and then for extension. And actually, he put together a committee that was called the, the fifth committee because he had uh, four committees already established that were pretty much your traditional areas, but realized that there was something probably missing and how do you, how do you identify that. So uh, ended up putting me on that committee and um, little by little we made our way through the processes and, uh, and established this notion of an urban or a metro research and extension um, presence, uh, pretty undefined. From that, there were a series of uh, committees from the strategic planning process, and eventually the concept of an urban or metro research uh, center was, uh, was included in the strategic plan that went into effect uh, back there in, their, in the mid-2000s, so it was around 2005 or so when that um, uh, when that strategic plan was approved and of course the uh, research center, the Metro Research Center was in the third year of that plan which put it somewhere around 2008. So during that uh, 2005 and 2008 there were a number of other committees as you well know we all love committees and, uh, and so there were a series of committees and some, uh, some research surveys that were done with respect to trying to find out how many faculty had an interest in doing stuff in urban areas, et cetera. And we ended up um, launching the, uh, the program, the, the Penn State Center in Pittsburgh uh, around uh, 2000. 
eight, um, eight area, 2009. So with the establishment of this uh, Metro Research and Outreach Center in Pittsburgh, we they actually uh, separated me. I was serving as the extension director at the time for, for Allegheny County, and they separated me from that and uh, gave me a small staff, uh, essentially my administrative assistant, and then uh, through some grants and stuff that I ended up getting, um, bringing a couple of folks on to begin actually building this concept of, a, of an urban outreach post. Um, but the idea was that, um, that they wanted me separated a little bit from the extension program so that I could see the institution of Penn State more broadly. I was actually housed in what uh, was called uh, uh, Penn State Outreach and Online Education. Now, in those days, it was called Outreach. But essentially, uh, they held a lot of the kind of activities that the institution might have done and currently does with respect to continuing education, uh, distance education, tech transfer, and some of those kinds of um, initiatives. So I was able actually to use that time during, uh, during the early days to be able to reach into different colleges, uh, centers, and institutes across the institution and get a better feel for that. I think one of the things that was eye-opening to me was how insulated extension people are from their own institutions and really not understanding uh, the broader um, resources that are in, in many ways av available to us. <clears throat> uh, from 2009 to uh, around 12, we really used most of that time to uh, establish systems and kind of assess where we were, uh, looking at um, evaluating local needs and what the, what the relevancy of extension programs were to our urban audiences. And, uh, and making some uh, collaborative arrangements with some faculty and some other folks at University Park. And then from, uh, from 12 to 14, uh, developed an organizational infrastructure uh, that I'm going to go into in a little while. And then 2015, just four months ago, we moved into our new offices here. And again, I'll be going uh, into that with a little more detail here as we, uh, as we continue. So, um, why Pittsburgh? And uh, I think that that was a, a question that some folks had. And I think that there are a number of reasons why, uh, why Pittsburgh. Uh, number one, we, we were the second largest uh, and are the second largest uh, metropolitan area in Pennsylvania uh, with about 1.3 million people. Uh, Philadelphia itself is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 1.5 million. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well later. Um, we, we have 28 state and federal elected officials, uh, as with probably most of you out there who are in urban areas, we have this sort of onerous issue of how do we engage with such a large number of elected officials, what is our role, are we allowed to talk to them, if we do talk to them, what's the message, uh, how controlled is that, etc. Uh, we have uh, $500 million in annual foundation giving in, in, uh, in Pittsburgh, in the greater Pittsburgh area. It's, uh, we are one of the richest uh, philanthropic um, um, areas of the country, certainly per capita, uh, probably the highest or close to it. So the fact that our foundations give a half a million dollars or half a billion dollars per year where Penn State is, is receiving a very, very tiny percentage of that, if you could even measure the percentage. And of course, the main reason is that um, a lot of our institutions try to pull funding from these foundations and drag them to the um, center part of the state or to the, to the main campus, where um, almost all foundations, and particular local foundations, are looking for an impact in their local communities. And so uh, sending dollars up to University Park uh, it does not really meet their uh, their interest. We uh, we also have a huge Penn State alumni base. Allegheny County has more alumni in this county than another any other single county. Uh, certainly, if you look at the Philadelphia metropolitan area, because of their density and the size of the of that metropolitan area, that in the metro area there are um, many more alums. 
but in, in the county itself, uh, we have about 28,000 Penn State alumni and feel that that's an opportunity that we can use to help promote what we do and to elevate our profile in the, in the Pittsburgh area. And the other is, is that our program here uh, over the years has been well regarded. It was, we were, they chose Allegheny County to actually launch this. I guess one of the reasons why was because I was on a lot of those committees and, and, uh, and I had been sort of a, a pretty consistent and regular voice advocating for uh, urban extension throughout my career. Uh, unfortunately, in the Philadelphia area, they had gone through a number of various leaders in the county extension director position, and so the, the consistency of that message uh, was, not as, uh, was not as strong, unfortunately. Some other reasons, again, these are, these are things that, uh, that I use within my state to argue for, uh, for uh, more attention being given to Allegheny County and Pittsburgh, and you can just read some of these things that, um, um, that have been published over the last uh, couple of years, and I'm sure that um, most of you can find similar kinds of accolades that are uh, related to your respective cities, but uh, we felt that aligning uh, the land-grant institution and extension with some of these things would, uh, would bode well for, for them. Uh, this is just a map that gives you a little bit of an idea geographically where Pittsburgh sits within the county uh, and where our center is located, and I'll, as I, I'll talk a little bit about that in a little while. But uh, you can see that uh, Allegheny County, uh, the, the border there is sort of triangular and looking, looking and Pittsburgh sits uh, very much at the very center of that. We do have a number of regional, uh, Penn State regional campuses that um, sit outside the city. Uh, the Greater Allegheny Campus is in Allegheny County, but is in an area that's very difficult to get to. Each of these campuses is about a 40-minute drive from Pittsburgh. And so in terms of elevating the land grants profile in the Pittsburgh area, they are uh, pretty much outliers. So uh, that sort of added the argument to having a presence in the urban core, something that was much more central. Uh, and something that was uh, much more visible. So you can kind of get a sense for uh, where we are within the context of the geography here. So what is the Penn State Center engaging Pittsburgh? One of the problems I think that we have is that is how do we meet our land grant obligation? And you're going to hear me talk a lot about land grant and and while I often use, uh, land grant and extension kind of interchangeably. We know that the legislation is, is slightly separated, but I believe that the whole institution sits within the context of the land grant brand, and that's really valuable for us when we talk about how we position ourselves in uh, the greater Pittsburgh area. There are a lot of public uh, higher education institutions. There are a lot of private uh, higher ed insti institutions, but there is only one land grant uh, that's there, and so we, we try to utilize that. So what that does to uh, for us is how do we look at the kind of needs that are uh, that are here in, in an urban area, in the city and in the county, we look at this list of, of things that we, that we deal with every day. For those of you who uh, certainly have been with, uh, with Extension, uh, probably not a whole lot of those things are, are things that uh, we have ready access to. I will say that for, for all intents and purposes, it's really interesting to me that um, whenever we talk uh, internally about our urban issues, and we mention things like urban agriculture and um, uh, and to some degree green infrastructure and the sort of water and soil kinds of things. They tend to perk up because that's in their um, that's in their wheelhouse. But other issues uh, with respect to general quality of life, uh, urban youth violence. I mean, you can uh, list a litany of issues that are confronted in our highly dense and densely populated areas and try to figure out does extension really have a program area that, uh, that addresses those things. We really look at exemplifying this uh, 21st century land grant 
uh, mission, and uh, and we felt that establishing that urban platform and and looking at uh, this relevant and current research, where do we get that? Uh, the idea of bringing that research to uh, to address the community challenges to me is is critical in our argument as we. Uh, as we argue it essentially for, for our existence, I think, as we look out across the country. Uh, our our, our uh, pilot, our, our, I guess um, our sample here is really that we combine extension and outreach. And one of the things that we all know is that extension itself has very few uh, additional resources. I, I have to say that uh, even those uh, uh, extension directors across the country, uh, and I won't name names, but those who, who are strong advocates of urban extension, when you talk to them, oh, that's really, it's a tremendous thing, we really need to do that. How do you do that? Well, you have to go find the money. Uh, and so I think that we all recognize the fact that in order to have a, a significant impact in an urban area, extension funding as it sits right now isn't going to get it. And so, how do we uh, how do we cross that bridge? How do we how do we rise to the challenge of looking at uh, what can urban programming, the urban perspective, bring to the entire extension system? Uh, I think that's critical, and in, and in my estimation, critical for the future of extension as a whole. Uh, it's just something that we have to figure out. Our pilot approach really is, uh, you know, and everybody kind of knows these, and sort of uh, teaching research and extension or education research and outreach or you name however you do that, but land grant institutions are, are the only institutions with a mission that has the three-legged stool and I'm not sure that we uh, take advantage of that in terms of how we market and position ourselves in our urban areas as well as we could. This pilot approach really looks at that and, and promotes that in every way that we possibly can. Um, as many of you do, uh, it, the proof is really at the gra grassroots level and uh, how do we enhance direct contact with our urban communities. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around uh, urban extension educator or faculty competence and, and what, how does one uh, need to function within an urban community in order to be effective and work within uh, the extension system. And then the third uh, area that was that was important to us was to significantly elevate Penn State's presence, and you know, kind of through this uh, grassroots uh, relationship building piece. But and and I'm sure this is the case with all of your institutions. Penn State is held in high regard here. We're not talking about football games. Uh, we're not talking about sports issues. We're talking about the um, the research capacity, the the standing that our institutions have in our states and across the country and the world is is excellent. People in this area, regardless of the local uh, the local institutions that are that are actually uh, widely and highly regarded, Penn State is incredibly well respected. The problem is that most people can't say with confidence that Penn State is actually here and part of their community. And so it was important for us to establish this, uh, this center in, uh, in a central location that would reinforce the fact that in fact uh, the land-grant institution and Penn State is here and we're here to uh, be part of the community as we have been for over 100 years, but to penetrate areas of the community where perhaps we hadn't been before and go into programming that is much more relevant to the folks who are, uh, live here uh, day in and day out. So we, we went through a series of, of activities uh, in order to develop how we, how we do things and, and, uh, and where and, and why. And we spent uh, the better part of nine months to a year in uh, developing a strategic business plan we actually hired a consultant who helped uh, uh, take us through that process. And I have to tell you, it's interesting, when you bring a person in from the outside who's a consultant who's done, you know, uh, 150,
50 or 1,050 strategic plans and you begin trying to explain to them what extension does, it's really funny to watch their face. Uh, we are very complex. We, we have so many different things that we do uh, in many respects. Uh, sometimes they're connected, sometimes they aren't. Um, the strategic business plan was an interesting process for us because while the strategic business plan is really outward facing and the whole, the whole thing, the whole purpose of doing a business plan is to present it to the outside world, uh, the inside world also reads it and uh, in some ways have to give it their blessing and so there had to be some sensitivity to the language that was used uh, in the business plan for internal audiences and, and leaders within the institution. That was an interesting balancing act. It was probably probably increased uh, the amount of time that it took to do the plan by double. We could have probably had it done in six months or less and ended up taking uh, almost a year and going through. I can't begin to tell you how many revisions uh, we had to do. Um, from that a strategic marketing plan. It spun off a local marketing plan. Again, the local marketing plan different from what the marketing folks up at the University Park might do. And so we've had to. There's been a lot of work on uh, on establishing what the market position is here, uh, as seen by us here and as seen by local folks here. And I have to say that it's a it's an interesting discussion because again, the the internal audience. Uh, has certain pers perspectives and perceptions of who we are and where we are and where we play. They keep saying, you know, uh, that our uh, that some of our major competitors are University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon University, Duquesne University, on and on. We kept saying, uh, well, that's not really the case. Uh, most of our competitors are also our collaborators, and the greatest majority of them are uh, local nonprofits working in space. Um, then we moved on and uh, created a development plan. The development plan has a number of different strategies uh, with respect to what we hope to do, how much money uh, we need to, to, uh, to, to uh, raise, how we're going to do that. And we're in the early stages of that to some degree, but we're employing connections with the broader university and the various development offices to, uh, to help implement that. And the final was um, the uh, uh, we, we purchased uh, through a consultant, uh, Trip Umba, the uh, economic impact study, and uh, again, that was a, a total study of of uh, kind of 20 all, all the way out to 20 years out to see what the impact would be if we were to um, if we were to create the the center that was uh, listed in our strategic business plan, and then extrapolating certain dollars and and economic impact uh, here. Uh, we are, uh, whenever we uh, talk to our outside audiences, we will take bits and pieces of all of these, of all of these uh, documents with us because they all, again, help with the framing and provide support for discussions that may, uh, that may proceed with respect to you know, why are we here, what is it that we're trying to do, how do we differentiate ourselves in the market from other institutions and nonprofits, what's our value prop proposition, and then what's our capacity and what's our relevance. So we try to roll all of that into uh, our organizational development and the development of these uh, documents. So our strategic business goals were, uh, again, to implement this new metropolitan land grant um, uh, model and what what does that look like? What's the impl implementation process? So, so the, the business plan ended a couple of uh, I mean we, we completed it about a year and a half or so ago. So we we have implemented it, this model and we are in the process of implementing it. Uh, then building capacity and, and offer expanded engaged scholarship. So uh, at Penn State the the, the new president has. Um, has uh, put out a challenge, should I say, a goal that by the year 2020, every Penn State graduate will have had uh, a substantial and meaningful experience in the real world outside of classrooms as they relate to their professions, majors, uh, or courses. And so the, the entire institution has been gearing up and putting together systems internally 
on how to get that. We have uh, about 96, 97,000 students in our system. Uh, right now, less than half of them are graduating with an engaged scholarship um, scholarship experience. And so we, in our urban areas, feel that there is a huge capacity for us to serve as a platform for those students to come to Pittsburgh uh, and, the, and the surrounding areas to become involved in these kinds of engaged scholarship types of activities. Uh, from, a, uh, from a little bit of a selfish perspective, we see this locally as essentially expanding our programming capabilities. Uh, having bright students coming into our city and our county and beyond and working with local nonprofits, agencies, corporations, etc. Uh, from Penn State and, and helping uh, deal with various challenges is uh, just uh, an incredible opportunity. And so this, the, the entire system, the institution, and uh, we here in Pittsburgh continue to work towards what does that look like? How do you work out the logistics? How do you, how do you uh, encourage faculty who have not necessarily uh, done very much of this to do that? So there's a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of interesting uh, pieces that, that go into trying to get this done, but we see this as a huge opportunity. The next is to develop an urban brand and identity, and it's really interesting. We, we have these regular conversations, and they're kind of coming to a head with our marketing folks. And what we say is we, we do not want to look like uh, our, our website to look just like any other Penn State website. We need it to look um, as though it belongs in the city. It needs to be gritty. It needs to be unique. It needs to be uh, does not need to be institutional looking and so we've we can we continue to challenge them so the whole brand and identity uh, creating templates so that every time anybody does anything out here uh, in our communities that we have a certain look and and I mean something beyond um, you know the Penn State shield or the university shield or the word uh, Penn State extension or something like that so uh, that's been kind of challenging and we're, we're getting closer and we hope to start working on a new website here within the next few weeks. Um, develop and implement a fundraising strategy. Again, I mentioned this a little bit before. We have an incredibly rich community with respect to the foundation and, and what we can do in there is just really uh, pretty phenomenal. But working with all the various uh, found, uh, various um, development folks within the institution uh, can be a bit tricky. We want to expi uh, expand the applied research and, and how can we get more faculty to do more things here in the Pittsburgh area uh, is, is to some degree connected to engaged scholarship but really about faculty and what they have an interest in doing. Serve as an on-site lead uh, to facilitate Penn State uh, activities here in the Energy Innovation Center and kind of serve as that platform um, as a location to, to help um, uh, position Penn State here. And then the last one is increase the alumni uh, involvement. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier. So in our strategic business plan, one of the things we always had problems with was how the heck do we explain what extension does? And so we kind of came up with this, uh, with this uh, three bucket uh, perspective and so whenever we talk about what we do we talk about community and economic development we talk about environment and horticulture and we talk about quality of life in youth development healthfulness in the arts and so then we cluster these programs underneath that but we are able to speak uh, a little more concisely within a context of our strategic business plan by using these three buckets as a way of explaining kind of what we do in a broad sense and we use the land grant uh, as 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 sort of the framing, so we talk about you know the land grant being uh, we are unique, we are the land grant. Talk a little bit about what that is, then talk about what it is that we do, and then you sort of take that uh, inverted pyramid down to the more specific programs that are happening out in the communities, why we're doing what we're doing. But that's kind of how we skin that cat. 
This is a list of internal partners. We, we partner in inside the institution with extension, outreach, and online education, as they've been, uh, as they're now called. Uh, various colleges outside the College of uh, Sciences, uh, Ag Sciences, we're doing stuff with engineering, business law, uh, arts and architecture, uh, and some others. Uh, we're also working with the regional campuses that are listed there. Uh, we're doing some things with World Campus, uh, which is our online education program. Uh, we have uh, strong relations with our corporate and foundation relations folks, university marketing at a number of different levels, outreach marketing, extension marketing, uh, government relations to try to make sure that we're on target with uh, who we need to talk to and when and why, and then certainly with our alumni relations. When you look at our external supporters, this is a list of folks we work with and who support what we're doing. Uh, there's a whole, you know, break them down and, and however you want to do that. Uh, certainly our elected officials are folks we want to keep in touch with, uh, local economic development entities, and there's a bunch of them here. Uh, we, we collaborate with uh, University of Pittsburgh, CMU, Duquesne Community Colleges on various programs. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,500 uh, nonprofits all out there kind of running around doing all kinds of things. Uh, keeping in touch with the local foundations and letting them know what we're doing. And we also created a pretty high-level Allegheny County Advisory Council uh, that we use to actually help um, steer where we're going. So the last couple of minutes, I really just want to talk about uh, where we're located within uh, within this community and uh, have some pictures of, uh, of, of where we are. So uh, we are located right there. Uh, uh, at the uh, Energy Innovation Center, it sits on uh, it sits right across the street from a 28-acre uh, redevelopment site where the old Civic Arena used to be. That's where the Penguins played. It was a big silver-domed um, structure, which is no longer there. Uh, we sit right adjacent to that land. It's the, one of the largest uh, urban redevelopment projects going on in the country. It's uh, a, a sustainable community. It's supposed to draw some 3,000 new jobs. You can see the payroll stuff there. And so that's kind of where, where we're sitting within the context of the city. This is a, a picture of the building. Uh, this building was built in 1929, uh, 1930. It went into operation of the school year 30-31, and it was owned by the City of Pittsburgh Public Schools. Uh, it was the first academic Votech high school built in this country. Uh, students could come here, take their academic classes in the same building as, as they're taking their Votech classes. In its, in its heyday, they offered 29 different trades, uh, every kind of carpentry, uh, HVAC, electric. They actually have a for, had a forge where they would, they would actually pour uh, iron, uh, auto body and auto mechanics, uh, welding, you name it, they had it in there. It was pretty phenomenal. It went into disrepair uh, and disuse uh, around the early 70s, and the school district started to decentralize its career and tech ed stuff. So it was a group of people who were brought together by uh, a congressman and a state uh, senator about seven years ago and said, we want to do something in this Pittsburgh area that is going to elevate our profile in the area of sustainability and workforce development. And so uh, I was on that uh, on a group and we met for about six or nine months doing some strategic planning trying to figure out what the heck that meant. At the time we didn't even know it meant a building. But at all intents and purposes it finally came down to we needed somewhere where uh, organizations, businesses and some and, and and agencies could all sort of cluster and have a water cooler effect around these issues. And so this was the building that was chosen. It's a $43 million uh, cord shell, uh, 28 different funding sources. It, um, it is uh, historically significant in that it received uh, historic tax credits, uh, new market tax credits, and conservation easement tax credits. It's also on the National uh, Historic Registry and it is a highly rated lead platinum building, uh, as I understand it, somewhere in the top three in terms of point, points accumulated in, in lead, uh, one of the top three or four in the country. Also uh, capture 95% of the rainwater that falls on this site and keep it on site because uh, 
as you may know, your cities probably suffer some, from the same problems that we have for the most part in a combined sewer and stormwater system that is overly taxed. Uh, just another picture of that, the academic tower is on the right side of that. That's where the students would take their classes. And the sawtooth section is where uh, they take their Vortec, Votec area. We rent uh, about 8,000 square feet in this building. The yellow arrow indicates the floor. All of those windows along the bottom there are, are our windows. That's where we're located uh, in this structure. Uh, this is just a, um, a shot of the structure looking from across town. And, um, and then this is what our internal offices look like. Uh, we have an entire wall of windows. And so all of our program managers, extension educators are in those glass uh, open sort of ceiling uh, offices there to allow the light in. But you could be sitting at your office and seeing the skyline. And I'll show you that in just a second. This is just another shot of that uh, when you're in your office looking out. Uh, this is a view that you see uh, of the city. Uh, pretty, pretty terrific. I think that uh, most people who work here are, are pretty happy to, uh, to come to work uh, and, and be in the office. So uh, that uh, concludes my remarks. This is a, a shot of an auditorium that's in the building. Uh, it was an old high school, so it has uh, an auditorium that holds about 750 folks. It will be uh, it will be cleaned up and uh, and be used here probably within about a year or so. We just moved into the building about four months, and it's still in the process of being uh, built out. So I will uh, at this point, I think, turn it back over to uh, the moderator. Thank you, Dino. Well, we, we do have a couple of questions who've come through, and um, I urge you as you're um, sitting here to enter your questions into the questions pod, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, so the first one, Dino, is why wouldn't you want to carry through with the Penn State brand? We are working hard to remind people who we are and where we are from, and in doing so, we've received support from campus, including upper administration. Um, yes, we, we capitalize on, on the Penn State brand and that's really what we, that's exactly where we uh, try to position ourselves. There, there are these really interesting internal debates, as may, may, maybe many of you have, with respect um, to which portion of Penn State. So the extension folks are saying, oh, you know, you should say extension. and and uh, the PenTap folks say you should say PenTap, and the campus folks say you should mention our campus. But for all intents and purposes, our strength, we feel, is in the term Penn State. We spent probably uh, three months uh, naming the center. It's really funny. We started with one of the first ones was uh, the, Metro, uh, the Metro Center, <clears throat> Pittsburgh Metro uh, Research Center, and we did some we did some surveying of the public and people thought it was where people could find a bus or a train or something. So, uh, so we, we ended up with this kind of pretty, <clears throat> uh, pretty standard. It's the Penn State Center. We use the tag word Engaging Pittsburgh. And then for Philadelphia, it's the same thing. It says Engaging Philadelphia. So we do capitalize on our Penn State brand. Thanks, Dino. Um, Another question here, do you have any plans to expand to other cities? So we are, we are having conversations um, at the administrative level. So currently there is a Penn State uh, Center engaging Philadelphia. It's, uh, the, there has been an extension office in Philadelphia <clears throat> for as many years as been an extension office here, uh, but they've gone through uh, some significant challenges over the years with uh, their space location, um, local funding, and that, those sorts of things. Uh, but uh, started a couple of years ago, we, we sort of are, are trying to push this, this same model to Philadelphia. There are also other uh, corridors in, in Pennsylvania, uh, sort of the Lehigh uh, Valley Scranton area, which is uh, north of Philadelphia, potentially in the Harrisburg area, potentially the Erie area. We're just starting to have conversations uh, 
internally around that to see well, how does our state want to define urban and I think that's something that is important for each state to do. Uh, it sometimes it's uh, a combination of your uh, population density but also relevant programming. So if you're doing programming that's kind of uh, that's that's urban related, <clears throat> but your population isn't you know half a million. That then maybe that's uh, that's okay. And so I think that each state has to define that. And yes, we are looking at expanding this uh, this urban presence or urban programming type of uh, work in other areas of the state. Um, another question has come in. How do you compete with other local agencies? doing similar programming and for funding? So there's there's a little bit of a historic uh, perspective to this. Uh, for a good number of years, we, we did not really go after uh, any foundation funding. Uh, the reason at the time was that we were getting state and federal funding and county funding to support our programming. Uh, and we used our local nonprofit partners uh, as, as a way of extending our program and, and did a lot of that. Um, I think there's an interesting scenario that occurs that, that, that a lot of those nonprofits end up using our material and then, and then not providing any kind of a, a, um, recognition of, of, of us. So, as, as the downturn in terms of our funding started a number of years ago, and I think um, all of you out there have suffered the same thing, <clears throat> over a three-year period, we lost 25% of our funding. And uh, I think probably from the time I started until now, we're, we're, I would say that our, our um, sustained extension educators uh, or faculty, as you might call them, in, in the counties is probably between I don't know, probably somewhere around 30% of what it was uh, back then. So all of these things uh, and pressures uh, caused us to now begin looking at foundations. So you have this really interesting dynamic that is both a partner and a competitor. Uh, a lot of times what we do is we partner with, with our uh, partnering organizations and, and, uh, and go together for funding. We have a number of projects where a nonprofit uh, partner may may lead, uh, and so the funds go to them, and then we subcontract with them. Um, there's an understanding, of course, going into all this, how we're to be recognized, etc. In other in other cases, uh, we we become the the recipient of the funds, and then turn over certain dollars to our our uh, our local nonprofit partners. So uh, there, uh, you know, there is definitely tension, but the reality is that. Almost all of the best practice that's being used by these nonprofits, particularly anything that has to do with anything in the environment, uh, from ag to natural resources, all of that's all of their information is coming from us, and so you know it's kind of an interesting conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Dino, and we've got uh, maybe time for one more question. If you can answer it quickly. Um, you mentioned that many extension leaders that are pro-urban extension also believe there needs to be a new source of funding for urban extension. Do you see a National Urban Extension Act in the future that could provide capacity funding for urban extension across the nation? So I think that a, a National Urban Extension Act would be really difficult uh, from a land grant perspective because frankly it may open the door for urban serving institutions to make the play that they should be the people who are doing who are delivering the urban piece of that I think that where we need to be is to um, strengthen our relationship with uh, USDA and NIFA uh, with a partnership through ECOP and and make sure that we are recognized as a significant player uh, in the extension world, being serving 80% of the population of the world, and using them as a conduit to make relations and significant and serious relationships with other federal departments like HUD, like Health and Human uh, Services, like EPA. I mean, you can go down the list of, of, of a lot of different departments 
who could utilize our uh, network and the partnerships that we already have established to, um, to push out a, a litany of programs. So I think there are a lot of different ways of skinning the cat and there, are, and there are a lot of ways of getting additional resources into the extension system, um, but I'm not sure that trying to push that kind of level of legislation uh, would be the best way at this point. Dina, thank you so much for your presentation and thank you all for participating in the webinar today, which was offered at no charge through the support of contributing members to the Western Center for Metropolitan Extension and Research. At the end of this webinar, we will launch a brief survey, so please take time to complete the survey to help us improve future webinars and so we can share the value and impact of this webinar with our contributing members. The Center holds monthly webinars on the last Thursday of the month from noon to 1 p.m. Pacific time. Please join us on October 29th to learn about Oregon State University, Portland Metro Area Extension. Registration is open and available from the Center's website. For other Center opportunities, check out our website and join our email list. And save the date for Extension as Urban Policy Advisors and the National Urban Extension Leaders Meeting, the first week of December in Sacramento, California. That concludes our webinar for September 2015. Thank you, Dino DeShantis, Don Pierce helping in Pullman, and to all of you for joining us. From the Western Center for Metropolitan Extension and Research, have a great afternoon.